So hi Kostu, great to have you on conversation about cats and what an exciting cat this is. A little bit about you, you work with the Snow Leopard Trust and you have been in all sorts of exciting parts of the world because snow leopards occur all over the place. Kostu leads a small team with support from international organizations to coordinate a unique alliance called the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystems Protection Program. The Secretariat is based in Bishkek. This uh, brings together the governments of 12 snow leopard range countries, NGOs and conservationists. He's a senior regional ecologist at the Snow Leopard Trust and helps with field research, data analysis, conservation and training programs. Um, he's done some work earlier on the rare four-horned antelope, also called the Chausinga in India. Been always interested in population ecology, conservation biology, and technology uses for conservation. So we share that in common. That is wonderful. So before we start, Kostub, on your presentation, I just wanted to talk a little bit about snow leopards because I think people really don't know very much about them. As they're one of the lesser seen and lesser heard of species in India at least. So can you tell us about the snow leopard? Are they found only in India or are they found in other places as well? Let's start from the basics. <laughs> Hi, Latika, and thank you really. Thank you very much for having me on this uh, uh, on this discussion uh, <laughs> board, if you may say so. Really a pleasure talking to you. And so talking about the snow leopard, um, there are 12 countries across the world where they are found. And mm -hmm. uh, these include India, sure. But uh, the, the most snow leopards in the world are in China, followed by Mongolia, and then India, Kyrgyzstan, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and the other countries follow. So, so yeah, snow leopards, if you look at them, they are more like the, the custodians of this uh, central South Asian high mountains uh, from where a lot of rivers originate, where we, uh, yep. Yeah, around the areas where we live. Fantastic. And just for uh, uh, for people to know, how large is a snow leopard? When you're looking at it, most people are used to tigers and they're used to leopards. Yeah. So how does this compare? So roughly a snow leopard would be around 35 to 45 kilograms in weight. Uh, so you can certainly look at them as lighter than even the common leopard or an adult common leopard. Uh, mm -hmm. Size-wise, you... Uh, you can just call one meter of a body and one meter of a tail. So yeah. it's, it's one of those charismatic species whose tail is an entity in itself, right? Yeah, uh, so it's like a python that's moving behind the, snow, <laughs> the, yeah. the cat all the time. <laughs> yes, amazing. Okay, and, um, and if I understand correctly, there is almost no records or no records of a snow leopard having attacked human beings. So it's uh, not the snow leopard. Yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead, um, go ahead. And so I said, so it's, it's not the, we who have to fear the snow leopards, but more the threat is more from us to them. Is that, is that correct? That's right. I mean, uh, there are a couple of instances where snow leopards are known to have uh, counter-attacked humans but in almost 100% of those cases it has happened when a cat has been cornered and out of fear just to get out of that cornered space they may have 
uh, they may have charged. But really, I mean, there's no known deaths to hu of humans uh, because of snow leopards at all. And um, I mean, uh, why do we need to go elsewhere? I've had my my closest ever encounter, really less than a meter from a cat, where it just came up on a ledge, found me there, and almost made an expression like, how can a human get so close to me and I don't get to know? Turns around and just flares away like a ribbon. So yeah, I mean, they just, yeah. they just want to avoid you as much as possible. Yes, I've, I've experienced that too. So yes, I know what you're saying. <laughs> so could we um, see your wonderful presentation now, please? Sure, thank you. Okay, I'll start with this beautiful picture of a beautiful girl uh, whose name is Kaniki. Now Kaniki uh, lives uh, her, with her family in the mountains of central Tianshan and her father is a herder who makes just about uh, two and a half thousand dollars per year. Now if I tell you that her family receives services uh, whose economic value is nearly eighteen thousand dollars per year which is up roughly seven times their family income, you, you'll obviously think twice about the numbers that I'm saying. But I'm not exaggerating. Uh, it is actually these pristine mountains that provide up to 30 provisional services that can be valued in terms of the actual cost uh, uh, in terms of what people are receiving from these mountains. Not just Kaniki, but these mountains also provide uh, water to billions of people of the planet living downstream. We all follow news and would know the economic damages that extreme climate events are causing across the world. Uh, whether it's the bushfires in Australia, the frozen lakes of American Midwest, or the catastrophic cyclones that we are facing in the Indian subcontinent. It's these extreme events are not just terrible for survival of life on earth but they also destroy our economies now while the glaciers and Burma frost layers in the mountains of central and south asia uh, are one of the finest carbon sinks that help keep our climates in control it is these mountains that are also most vulnerable to climate uh, climate catastrophe that's going on around us it's no uh, it's not even debatable that if you want to be healthy you want your neighborhood to be healthy if you want to be healthy your ecosystem must be healthy and there is this one species that we can easily claim uh, to be serving as the thermometer of the health of this uh, of the mountains of central and south asia and uh, it's these mountains which are also called as the third pole uh, because of the amount of water they have stored in them. It is no surprise that cultures and religions across the region revere this predator, uh, for it is the custodian of not just the mountains, but entire ecosystems. And also why conservation of this one species through community-based approaches uh, is known to address not just one or two, but 10 to 13 of the 17 sustainable development goals uh, defined by United Nations. Well, no guesswork there. I am talking about the snow leopard, which is a species uh, that does not need visas and passports to traverse through its home ranges, uh, which cut across uh, international borders often. And one reason we also call the snow leopards as the ambassadors of the mountains of Central and South Asia. Uh, I mentioned earlier, the snow leopard are distributed across nearly 2 million square kilometers of the rugged high mountains of Asia. Uh, it is these mountains that are also the origin of rivers that have fed uh, and nurtured civilizations for millennia and are still feeding civilizations. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it won't be an overestimate to say that billions of people uh, from one of the most populated continent in the world are dependent on these mountains 
and the snow leopard, uh, the mountains that are guarded by the snow leopard for uh, uh, for water, which is a limiting resource if one would want to call it one. Um, snow leopards are found in 12 countries, which start from Bhutan and Nepal to the south, south to all the way to Mongolia and Russia. And you can see there is a belt of, uh, of uh, rugged mountains in between uh, connecting Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, all the way from Kazakhstan to Russian Federation and Mongolia. Uh, so you can see that it is uh, it is some of those uh, these incredible countries which have very rich cultural heritage, uh, which have a very rich history and past uh, where the snow leopards are found. Now, interestingly, uh, although the snow leopards live in high mountains, uh, they live below the altitude where you have permanently frozen surface uh, glaciers or in other words no vegetation uh, but they also live above the altitude where there are negligible trees in other words uh, they live in a rather narrow altitudinal belt now think of the changes that we are causing to the earth uh, think of climate change and you will notice how species will have to readjust to the changes in the habitat in the times to come Snow leopards also have very large ranges uh, for a female ranging uh, in more than 100, 120 square kilometers and males typically ranging in more than 250 uh, square kilometers and some floaters, youngsters as well as uh, older individuals traveling several hundred square kilometers. Uh, with such large ranges, uh, they do interface heavily with humans uh, and when a large predator interfaces with humans or livestock, they're bound to cause conflict. Yep, we just discussed the large home ranges that snow leopards have, and with with such uh, such large ranges, they are bound to interface with humans and livestock. That, in turn, can cause conflict, and it does cause conflict. Uh, snow leopards face a multitude of threats. These threats include retaliatory killing, where angry herders would persecute them uh, for losing their livestock. Uh, there are poachers who are uh, always on the lookout for illegal wild, uh, to uh, feed the illegal wildlife trade. And uh, there are greedy hunters who might uh, want to over harvest the, the wild prey out of greed. Uh, What's really fascinating though and what's really intriguing in this case is uh, uh, that threats that did not even seem like a possibility about 20 years ago have come up as major threats now. For instance, destruction of habitat for poorly planned infrastructure, mining, and something as horrible as canned hunting of snow leopards for trophies are some of the emerging threats uh, the f species is facing today. We all love dogs. I have grown up with dogs, but uh, we love dogs at homes. We can't have dogs out in the wild. Uh, cause and, and dogs are causing havoc to our ecosystems. Uh, they're not just competing with snow leopards and wolves for wild prey. Uh, they are. They have become one of the biggest threat to even domestic livestock in some of the mountain ecosystems. Uh, where studies have been conducted. Um, when properly implemented, we all know tourism can be a boon for conservation because it, it builds the, the best possible connection between livelihoods and well-being of wild, wildlife. However, uh, there's a fine line that differentiates uh, well-implemented tour tourism from a poorly implemented tourism model. And especially in these fragile mountain ecosystems, if implemented poorly, uh, if not uh, conducted carefully, uh, it can destroy, it can cause m massive destruction to the fragile mountain ecosystems. Lastly, your and, I, your and my lifestyle uh, is resulting in rapid climate change. I mentioned about it a little earlier, but uh, people often ask, where do you rank climate change as threat to snow leopards uh, or these mountain ecosystems? 
I would actually go ahead and say it's not a threat, but it's the mother of all threats. Uh, um, it's it's anybody's guess that with increasing temperatures, surfaces that have been frozen for years will melt and bring along pathogens, including viruses and bacteria, that our bodies are not likely going to have any immunity against. I mean, if anything, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has shown how our disregard of nature uh, leading to an unavoidable interaction with wildlife uh, through illegal poaching and wildlife trade can lead to not just loss of life, but widespread economic crisis at m various levels, local, national, regional, as well as global. So in a nutshell, if I may say so, climate change is going to interact with each existing threat, each emerging threat at a, with a different uh with, at, at a different scale and will ultimately amplify them uh to greater proportions than than what we are facing today uh, quickly changing gears uh, how do we address this uh how do we address these threats that snow leopards are facing so as you all would will appreciate historically the conservation movement started with the idea of protected areas uh, which to a reasonable extent have managed to conserve some of our star species, you know, be it the wolves, bisons, tigers, and so on. Uh, the challenge, however, is that uh, uh, these models work only uh, in, in a few places. For example, in case of snow leopards, less than 10% of the protected areas are big enough to protect a viable population of snow leopards. Now, that, that makes uh, that deems most protected areas redundant when it comes to saving snow leopards within protected areas. Uh, a large number of conservation programs, uh, especially the successful ones uh, that are being implemented in snow leopard habitat, focus on using economic or economically driven incentives for conservation. Uh, these could be community-owned ecotourism programs, uh, insurance programs for livestock, community enterprise programs that produce handicraft and so on. However, uh, uh, it's, it's anybody's guess, these programs at best offset losses that people face uh, because of sharing their spaces with wildlife. And often the contribution of these uh, programs is, um, is often a fraction of uh, the average annual incomes. So in 2017, the Kyrgyz government invited its counterparts uh, to what we call as the International Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Conservation Summit uh, and a Green Economic Forum in Bishkek. Uh, and this was the first time business leaders from Central and South Asia participated as possible allies. The purpose of this Green Economic Forum was to engage businesses that are otherwise seen as the adversaries when it comes to um, environmental losses and this is where the whole idea of changing the conversation about conservation spawned so what we need is uh, we need a new paradigm where we look at conservation as an essential entity to facilitate economic development uh, what it requires is looking at conservation more, more hol holistically than it is right now uh, in most parts of the world. Uh, if you see, look at this graph, you will notice that conservation plans often look at the first three zones to work in. What we really need to add is a fo the fourth zone, which is that of sustainable livelihoods. Uh, and this is where the links between livelihoods and ecosystem conservation uh, can be explicitly stated and valued. Talking about valuation of ecosystem services, uh, I'd like to share uh, some very interesting figures uh, that were part of my colleague, Dr. Ranjani Murali's PhD work that recently got published uh, in the Journal of Arid Environments. Now, I'm sure you all know Pashmina. Uh, th it's a fashionable fiber that is sold at a premium across the world. Uh, roughly, it costs around uh, 100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, $
to a roughly around three to four hundred dollars per kilogram. Obviously, I'm not accounting for the craftsman's ship that's gone behind this. We're just translating everything in terms of weight. Now, Ranjini, she went to three landscapes. Uh, two of them are producing pashmina, uh, Changtang in India and South Gobi in Mongolia. As one would expect, she found that herders get a much lower fraction of the cost of pashmina, which is less than $40 per kilogram. Fair enough to some extent, uh, but here comes a staggering figure. Ranjini's calculations estimated that the economic value of ecosystem services, those ecosystem services that can be uh, that can be bought in the market for actual cost or for actual payments, uh, those economic services uh, such as water, fodder, and so on, uh, to produce one kilogram cashmere or one kilogram of pashmina, uh, the economic value of ecosystem services is a staggering. 500 to 700 dollars per kilogram now we are not paying that cost i don't think anybody is paying that cost but someone is and that someone is probably nature uh, we all appreciate there are no free lunches and if nature is being made to pay for something she will have her own means to get a payback and probably what we are seeing around the world is one of those means um, so to conserve our ecosystems, its guardians, and ultimately ourselves, what we really need is knowledge, action on the ground, and prioritization in policies. We can no longer afford um, any more degradation of our natural ecosystems in the name of economic development. And uh, it is almost as if we are trying to make revenue in one currency, in this case, money, uh, at the cost of another currency, which in this case is our own well-being and health. Uh, the economic cost of climate change and zoonosis uh, are no unknowns to us today. Uh, I don't think we can any longer be treat nature's bounty as a freebie because it is coming to us at a cost. It does come to us at a cost. And we ourselves are ending up paying for it. Uh, so what I'd like to end with is uh, re-emphasizing that Snow Lip, uh, that, that ecosystem conservation is not a choice but a necessity for our survival, for our well-being and for our economies. Uh, if anything, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us uh, in no uncertain terms uh, how closely our lives and the livelihoods, our own livelihoods are linked to natural ecosystems and why um, illegal wildlife trade, habitat destruction, depletion of biodiversity are not someone else's, but everybody's concern. So unless we use good science to build knowledge, uh, I don't think we will be able to preempt the losses that zoonosis, climate change related extremities and biodiversity loss will bring about in the coming years. And with that, I'd like to stop. Um, Thank, Thank you. you. I'm just taking off from what you said and no. uh, asking you a tough question, which I get hit with all the time. Um, one of the things that people ask me is why this obsession with cats? Why are you only talking about cats? Um, the landscapes are shared by other predators as well. There are other cats like the lynx, there's the Tibetan wolf. Um, what exactly is the role of the snow leopard? Is it the apex predator? How does it compare to the wolf? And what impact will the extinction of the snow leopard have on these ecosystems? What yeah. can you explain that yeah. to everybody? Okay, multiple parts to this question. But to begin with, we work with the snow leopards for various reasons. And as you rightly mentioned, it being the apex predator is the ideal thermometer that we have which defines the health of everything that its umbrella is covering right uh, so things go wrong with the with the pastures they will reflect on the snow leopards things will go wrong with uh, with pollinators let's say bees for example you know you bring in an invasive species of bees in an area and they start uh, uh, 
displacing the local species of pollinators your vegetation will change the herbivore composition will change and ultimately the snow leopard will get affected so i think what they do is they are a, a, a fine indicator of of a healthy functional ecosystem uh, yes they are very beautiful i agree and there is a bit of a bias there for sure we you know it, it's it's just such a charismatic species why wouldn't you want to save it to begin with but uh, and it does, doesn't end there if you look at the cultures and religions and folk tales from these regions snow leopards and tigers and all these charismatic species they occur everywhere so they 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 are they are a symbol of our reverence of our uh, fascination and of our uh, uh, fondness of what's out there in nature right so they are they are an ambassador in other words you know they they represent the entire ecosystem yes i would love it if someone would like to have a a dung beetle as an ambassador of an ecosystem why not and they are you know uh, but it it doesn't mean that any species is less uh, uh, charismatic it's it's about how you look at it you know it's about uh, uh, perception yes okay did i miss your other question i'm so sorry <laughs> there was another <laughs> question <laughs> uh, not so question <laughs> yes, go ahead okay. go ahead um uh, okay so you we were talking about the fact that protected areas cover very small portions of snow leopard um yeah. you know territories and yeah. um so i mean going back to snow leopard territories what is the is the average size over 100 kilometers does it go less in some places more in others is there a big variation in size not quite to be honest uh, there are studies earlier studies used radio telemetry and i can mm-hmm. never forget uh, ragu uh, ragu chundavat mm-hmm. making this very intriguing comment once uh, mm-hmm. saying that you know i i started to follow snow leopards with radio telemetry but i stopped following it because i ended up estimating my own home range because i couldn't <laughs> cross over those ridge lines as the snow leopard could <laughs> and that was a very very uh, a profound statement in many ways you know uh, mm. it's we who were limited by our mm. human abilities to be able to understand mm. the species beyond a yeah. certain extent but that's mm. where technology has come in Uh, as a boon to us uh, today we have uh, studies going on which are using satellite based telemetry and there are studies uh, this one of the longest studies on this uh, uh, on snow leopards is going on in south gobi in mongolia where so far uh, our team has collared uh, more than 30 snow leopards apart from that in nepal uh, in afghanistan sort of in pakistan one in snow, uh, snow leopard in pakistan uh and other parts uh, as well they have been some studies using telemetry and more or less they all indicate of course i, I, I shouldn't forget kyrgyzstan as well but they all indicate a relatively large home range size than what we had earlier thought it to be so uh the only published ones right now we have are from south gobi which indicate that the females home range is around 100 120 square kilometers uh males could be double that size So in a lot of uh, species like the marine mammals now they're using uh you know uh remote monitoring using satellites are you using that uh instead uh, of so, the traditional so, triangulation how does it work oh yes so th- these these collars are formula one as compared to the triangulation ones that we used mm-hmm. earlier mm-hmm. uh what they have is they have a gps in them they mm-hmm. have a satellite phone in them they have a radio beacon in them they have a small memory chip as well they have a motion sensor inside uh which is more like a 3d accelerometer that our phones have you know which allow you to play some games on phones as well now all of this is packaged into one small uh, unit and what these callers do is they record the location using gps uh and transmit that data through satellite phone over email to someone let's say i'm sitting here in bishkek and the snow leopard in mongolia is emailing me every 5 hours to the extent that people often joke that you know you guys are more in touch with your snow leopards than your own family well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 
so i thank you for sharing that because i think most people aren't aware of, uh, of you know how we how we do all of this yes. um i also know that camera trapping is an important tool for snow that's leopard right. monitoring that's right latika that's right uh, tell us about this how do you plan your camera trap placements how how often do you change their locations how often do you go to check them what does it involve because i know it's a huge huge effort to do of this yeah so latika so, if i go back to the times when uh, you know we were doing our research yes. yes i would have never ventured into snow leopards with camera trapping each mm. camera trap used to have those 32 Uh, photographs yeah. you know it could take yeah. only 32 pictures yeah. the yeah. battery would need to be changed every yes. day yeah. yeah i mean i would have never been able to physically climb yeah. those ridge lines every day to change those and i think again you know similar to what i mentioned about triangulation and telemetry with radio transmitters there was a constraint here as well again technology has come to a uh, a rescue uh, in in what what really has happened in the last uh, 15 20 years uh, digital photography has uh, has grown rapidly um uh, it comes with so many so many features now these camera traps we use today they don't need a flashlight so there's no blinding of an animal in the night they just use a uh, an infrared flash which is virtually invisible so it doesn't blind uh, an animal or a human or whoever gets photographed these cameras uh, can take up to 50 to 60000 pictures non stop how that means we can leave some of these cameras for up to even a year and just go once a year and collect them yes it if it gets lost if it it gets lost in avalanches or a or a, or a flash flood or something that's another challenge or it gets stolen that of course you can't help but otherwise uh, you know you can really leave them and let them be your eyes in the wild for months at end if not uh, up to a year and lastly they're quiet they don't make any sound at all so when a camera trap is taking pictures um, nobody gets to even hear them so they're very stealthy uh, devices little units and they can just sit there in those uh, mountains for for days and months and so on now so when it comes yeah how, sorry how do you how do you decide where to put them okay so snow leopards as we all know they are like one of those big cats very solitary they do come together for uh, sometimes sharing meals as any big cat does they do come together during mating season and of course females are uh, they they do move around with their cubs sometimes uh, well, grown up cubs as well but uh, you know like we communicate with our friends through social media uh, i think uh, all social media channels should pay a royalty to snow leopards because i feel they are the they, they, they had the original social media wall post concept uh, snow leopards what we call as scrape book they have their own scrape book where they uh, they look for specific locations which are you know under overhanging rocks or at perfect saddles where they they go and leave a sign and the sign could mean uh you know a, a male snow leopard sending out a message stay away from my territory or a female leaving sign saying that okay i'm looking for a boyfriend who knows you know what kind of mess what all messages are going around but really these are the messages that allow snow leopards to interact with each other and these are the locations where because they make these little scrapes uh with a bit of a training you can start figuring out uh you can start thinking like a snow leopard and uh, spotting those locations uh, these are these are the sites which are uh, very valuable for camera trapping work because they allow us to set cameras in a way that uh, uh we do get reasonable pictures and again like tiger snow leopards also have unique patterns uh it's not as easy if i may say so as it is to identify a tiger because tigers have a uh, thin coat snow leopards have this ruffled coat which gets it makes it look like different animals when it's wet when it's dry when it's in a different <laughs> position so yeah so that that's a bit of a challenge which makes it slightly difficult but uh, you can uh, with a lot of training and practice and uh, being brutal with your misidentifications you can uh, start identifying individuals 
and that's what we ultimately use to uh, to estimate their populations wow okay so another point that you brought up is that snow leopards actually live in a very narrow belt um right. sort of 3000 meters to about 4500 meters maybe going up to 5000 plus in in some areas now when uh, you see the effects of global warming and you see the effects um in climate change and sometimes snowfall patterns change then do they come low, you know uh, they stay up higher do they come lower how does that impact on the communities that are depending on them for tourism um you know people coming into for graph them how how have been yeah. an obvious change can you see that happening yeah now to begin with you know what uh, what's very interesting latika is that while in parts of india and bhutan they're not found below let's say 3000 meters or so in parts of mongolia they're found at 800 meters above mean sea level wow so there is a latitudinal shift wow. as well in their altitudinal gradient wow uh, which 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 makes it far more complex uh, in many ways uh, but yes everywhere they do have they do seem to have this band which seems to widen in certain seasons say in the in we expect it to be constricted a little bit in the uh, in the uh, winters we expect it to widen a little bit or the other way around you know really depending on where the food is so for a predator its life revolves around prey and uh, in some areas you do see them coming down uh, uh, to reasonably low altitudes uh, uh, well uh, relatively lower altitudes and that's largely accredited to uh, to the movement of prey because you know when everything's frozen up there there's nothing to eat so ibex and blue sheep might be coming down and then there would be an anticipated movement Uh, uh, you know just like oh, let, you know i'm i'm following my food wherever it is so that does happen and we do expect changes now the problem with climate change let's say it's is that the impacts are not linear it, mm-hmm. it it's a confounded impact you know in mm-hmm. some places it's it's going to lead to a very sudden extreme winter mm-hmm. now that will have its own impacts because mm-hmm. you know it will make food accessibility difficult to a lot of prey mm-hmm. whereas in other areas it might just warm things up so the you know the species prey might for the for the up actually in those areas yeah. so it, it's it's not going to be a linear impact that okay we are assuming everywhere they will just move up in some areas like in mongolia for example the, there's an there's a there used to be there, there's a this periodic uh, event they call zud which is extreme harsh winter the periodicity of so typically used to be once every 10 years if you look at the last 10 15 years it's happening every 2 3 years same is the case with flash floods in some parts of the range you know i mean i remember in chitral in pakistan 40 years they have people have been living there they have no memory of anything like a flash flood suddenly there was a flash flood and i think about 5 6 years ago and then the next year after there was another flash flood so what used to be an unknown phenomenon altogether has suddenly become a periodic phenomenon so these changes will have a very com- compounding impact on how humans also beha- uh, respond to them right you know people will lose tolerance to losses you know because of the kind of catastrophic losses they are facing uh, there will be more interaction potentially with snow leopards in some areas so so i i i wish i could say straight forward that you know what will be the effect on tourism and all we don't really under, we don't really know in some areas it might end up uh, getting better because the tourism season may increase you know for some people in some areas it will completely uh, turn it on its head and it'll just make it uh, a much shorter and a much harsher season altogether so it's it's really a bit of a kind of it's a bit complex uh, than uh, linear as a, i would say okay and so tell me um you you worked across all the 12 range countries what are some of the most successful community based conservation strategies that you've seen um and things that some of which might be in india but some of which may not so what 
what are the ones that you would identify as being most successful and things that we could replicate yeah. here so i would say the the most successful programs uh, for snow leopard conservation are the ones that look at partnership mm -hmm. you you build partnership with the local communities you build partnership with the local authorities or you build partnership with um, the agencies the the key being and and partnership it really can be broken down into multiple components where you know to have a good partnership you have to be present in an area you have to be very apt with your uh, approach you have to be responsive to what your partners needs are you have to be uh, uh, ethical in your approaches and so on so i think uh, the key especially and and i wouldn't want to limit it to snow leopard conservation but across the across the board uh, some of the most successful uh, sustained conservation programs build partnerships uh, with local communities they they build uh, uh, you know an ownership uh, or they aim at building ownership within the local communities and i think that's the key that need, we need to understand because we don't have that much space as may have been available uh, for a yellowstone for instance we don't have that kind of space we can we we cannot we don't have the luxury of exclusion uh, you know looking at it as an exclusionary approach that okay we'll deal with people separately we'll deal with conservation separately i mean you, you we end up making enemies uh, out of the key stakeholders who can be the best supporters of conservation yeah okay you also brought up the issue that um, much of the habitat is located along international borders and a lot of this is contentious um so how does this add to the difficulty of your work and um assessing species status monitoring how well it's doing how do you deal with these issues uh, so i think this is where uh, uh you know a program like the global snow leopard and ecosystem protection program um gslep mm -hmm. in short it, it comes in very valuable now yes and and we often say that transboundary programs are a term mm -hmm. that donors love countries mm -hmm. don't love it Absolutely. adds so much to uh, to the complications of dealing with uh, with an issue when you're dealing with an entirely yes. different sovereign country uh, yes. but what's really fascinating especially uh, uh, in case of snow leopard is that not just these 12 countries have come together and endorsed what we call as the bishkek declaration for snow leopard conservation but they have agreed to make unanimous decisions uh, which means everyone has to agree on what we want to do and it's not like one country will you know there's no voting they agree unanimously and i think this is the 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 convening power of the snow leopard that brings countries together on a platform number 1 and makes them agree on issues uh, number 2 uh, so yes it's not not challenging it is uh, it is uh, a complicated issue when you're dealing with multiple sovereign countries but i think i mean kudos to all the 12 countries for prioritizing snow leopard conservation or prioritizing information sharing uh, which facilitates management of certain landscapes within one's sovereign uh, boundaries but by sharing relevant information across border which can then be treated from uh, from a from a wider perspective as a holistic uh, landscape fantastic now tell me um out of interest is there like a database that people can access to get information about the snow leopard is there any such thing what kind of database are you looking for because uh papers research papers information oh, yeah. Yeah. um photographs i don't know okay. anything because <laughs> we don't okay. I mean I don't think the average person knows where to go to get that sort of stuff. All right. So to start with and forgive me for a shameless plug here but uh, please do visit uh, snowleopard.org that's the website of the organization I work with. We have a lot mm -hmm. of material for uh which explains and talks about the kind of work we are doing and our approach uh, is broadly about research based 
community based conservation or research you know community based conservation with research uh, mm-hmm. inputs and mm-hmm. so that you will have a lot of content there you may also find some uh, stuff we have created for children uh, some activities and tools to engage with uh, children and people of different age groups uh, if you are interested in something more uh, to do with uh, this multi country effort you know how our country is coming together what are they doing and what is this whole uh, conversation about snow leopards at that high level then uh, you can visit another website which is globalsnowleopard.org so one was snowleopard.org the other is globalsnowleopard.org uh, which again has a pretty in- very interesting uh, it's it's like a resource center of a lot of material that has been put together a lot of content which has been put together uh, and joint resolutions declarations consensus is endorsed by all the uh, 12 countries and so on so that's another website and lastly what you mentioned which is like research papers and all i urge you to please become a member of uh, snow leopard network now snow leopard network is a uh, is an uh, organization which is like a club of everybody who's doing something with snow leopards and it has students it has researchers conservationists uh officials anybody who's interested in snow leopard is a member uh and the snow leopard network has a formidable and an enviable bibliography of virtually every publication uh on snow leopard that has ever been uh brought out uh and it it does at times take some uh, uh important decisions because it's it's a consortium of all ngos all uh, organizations institutions and so on so that's the third so these are the three places where you can find a lot of material apart from of course social media you just search for snow leopard you have <laughs> a lot of material out there as well. Yeah. well thank you i mean that i think is really really interesting also in india we had got this program where people could actually post their tiger photographs with a location and a date and a uh, you know a time and uh, you could use this for monitoring snow leopards within areas where tourists go do you have a similar thing for snow leopards as well anywhere yeah so uh not quite uh yet for okay. a couple of other reasons as well because uh, i think i shouldn't use the word privacy in this case but uh, location uh, sharing has become a bit of a challenge in some parts you know new locations have opened up without being prepared for bringing in people right so that has been one of the reason uh, and and i mean the people going with both intentions right you can't stop people from going you know the people going with good intentions of uh of let's say uh, community based tourism but there are people with bad intentions of who knows poaching as well one reason why we we are a little more careful with sharing locations as such other than gener- generic uh, idea of this region the area but uh, there is an interesting uh, initiative we call it pause which stands for population assessment of the world's snow leopards now this effort is uh, is using a a very carefully designed statistical framework to ultimately estimate the world's snow leopard population because whether it's a taxi driver or a prime minister of a country well, nearly all the time the first question they ask you the moment they hear you working on snow leopards ah so how many snow leopards are there in let's say my country or in the world and we have no idea we yeah. have a very rough guesstimate which is up to 7000 So anyway coming back to this pause initiative what is this what this initiative is doing is it's trying to build a database um which is a mutually shareable database with checks and balances to ensure uh, unnecessary uh, prevention of unnecessary harassment of species or even uh, potential poaching but uh, this database is likely to become uh, uh become a good source of bringing in a lot of uh, uh, what i call you can call a citizen science data you know a lot of people are seeing animals and some pl- people are seeing them in places where a researcher would never probably bother to look and you know you end up oh i didn't know there could be a snow leopard in the middle of the desert and someone just driving past took a picture and shared saying that see we saw a snow leopard on the in the desert so so some of this database can be extremely valuable so there is this uh, this whole pause initiative which is going to gradually become one of those uh, 
resource centers where people will be able to share some of these uh, these data sets and this information great and i think um the important thing that we've also said here is that if you do take a snow leopard picture it's okay to share location data with a scientist or a group that's working with it but not necessarily right up front on all social media uh, because that please. can lead to a problem don't do that don't yes, do please. that yes please yeah yes, so i think that's Thank a great you. that's a great message okay so this has been fantastic kostub i think we've uh, We've covered so much stuff, and I think people are going to really enjoy this. Um, we might bombard you with some questions later if somebody no comes problem. up with something, but no we'll be in touch. Thank you, and A pleasure talking to you, Latika. Thank you, and thank you. think economy and ecology uh, are one and the same in fact economy is dependent on ecology